I am Delegate Eric Barron. Welcome members and uh, uh, members of the public who are watching on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our opening prayer by the Honorable Marvin Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let us bow our heads, please. <clears throat> to our leaders in local, state, and federal government, grant the wisdom to see beyond the boundaries of race and religion. Help our leaders to see that common humanity makes all of our children as brothers and sisters to one another. To those who have taken up arms in anger or revenge, or even in the cause of justice, grant them the grace of conversation to the path of peaceful dialogue and constructive collaboration. To the innocent and to the ignorant who live in the shadow of confusion and fear, be a shelter and strength and a haven of hope. And to those who have already lost their lives as victims of human cruelty and the pandemic, open your wide arms and enfold them all in embrace of your compassion, healing, and everlasting life. Grant this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Um, so th this morning we have a uh, special guest from the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. I want to thank uh, Delegate Susie Proctor for the excellent uh, suggestion uh, that we have them as uh, guests at our meeting. Um, and with that, I think we can uh, get started with um, the uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Memorial Library System, Ms. Roberta Phillips. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, delegates, for taking the time to listen today to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System folks. Um, we wanted to let you know what the library's current legislative priorities are. And I would also like to give special thanks to Brett Crawford, the president of the Board of Library Trustees for joining us today as well. Uh, with me today is Michael Gannon, our COO for Support Services, Michelle Hamiel, the COO for Public Services, Nicholas Brown, COO for Communication and Outreach, Shelly O'Brien, the Director of Development, Donor Engagement, Melanie Townsend Dimas, Achievement Gap, Virtual, Learn virtual Learning Challenges for Students, advancing digital equity and supporting Prince Georgian's workforce development needs with programs, online resources, and access to partners like Employ Prince George's. Our database BrainFuse Now has helped students engage in over 12,000 tutoring appointments, as well as almost 60,000 sessions logged in for educational support and resources. While our focus has been on delivering services in a way that's safe for customers and staff, curbside has been a hit with the community and we have had over 37,000 curbside appointments since we launched this program in July. We also uh, started an Ask a Librarian and Biblio Consulta Call Center, which has fielded over 17,000 calls um, offering accurate information about the healthcare crisis and the services and support the community can get um, both through the library and through our partners. We offer 3D printing and mobile printing, books by mail for seniors, and drive up Wi Fi. We are also partnering with the Housing Authority to place surplus computer equipment in affordable housing communities, providing internet access. Our online engagement has gone through the roof with over a thousand library produced virtual programs, new partnerships with organizations like the Washington Wizards and significant social media growth. For example, our YouTube, which is now streaming this, um, 
has increased over 1,600% in viewership. We held a Kendi uh, program on how to be an anti-racist that was viewed um, over 260,000, or had 260,000 viewers in over six continents. Uh, we continue to expand our offerings um, and what we're doing for the community. We held a uh, Operation Warm, which supplied 750 coats to children in Prince George's County and are helping with any relief efforts through our community partners. We are also really, really keenly aware that equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism work is very, very much needed. We are doing education through programs um, and reviewing our internal practices as well. One of the things that we have been doing is having diversity dialogues. Um, we've been supporting our LGBTQ community and really highlighting having conversations that matter. We had a lovely testimony from one of our customers. We had to suspend due to the spike in COVID cases, our curbside during the holiday season for several weeks, but the quote speaks really well to what the library has been doing. It says, PGCMLS is awesome. They sent a holiday email like, sorry, our curbside service is temporarily suspended. But here we have free movies, TV shows, music, crafting videos, newspapers, magazines, learning courses, live unemployment benefits assistance, and a food drive. So she was very impressed with our services. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your continued support. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Gannon to talk a little bit about funding for libraries. Good morning. Uh, we are facing a, currently a 5% cut in our county budget. Uh, however, our Maryland um, state uh, budget has, has remained um, firm. We are asking you to um, support us by overriding ve the veto. Uh, it was House Bill um, 1000, Building Lifelong Library Learners Act. Last year, uh, the governor vetoed it because um, it had a fiscal um, impact to it. Uh, it will um, allow the libraries to go uh, fine free. We've already gone fine free. We kind of um, are ahead of the pack in the state, but it will allow the other library systems to go find free for children. It will increase our um, per capita aid in uh, 2023. And it will also raise the cap state capital grant from $5 million to 7.5. And we've used the capital grant system to renovate five of our branches. So we have actually um, used it and gotten, uh, gotten a lot of uh, libraries renovated because of it. So while our, um, while our county uh, support is probably going down 5%, we're just asking that you maintain um, the funding for public libraries uh, at the state level. So we do appreciate, we know that you always support us and we appreciate that. Uh, so thank you. And, um, Melanie, will you talk a little bit about digital connectivity, please? Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Roberta. Thank you, delegates and senators here today. I wanted to uh, say, first of all, I am using <laughs> our internet, our Wi-Fi at the Largo location. So I know I, I, it, it's a testament to how somebody could be in their car and use Wi-Fi from the library. Isn't that wonderful? But uh, Roberta, you asked me to talk about House Bill 97 and Senate Bill 66, which I want to thank and lift up our, our delegates and our senators who were sponsors of that bill, especially our, our senators in our um, Prince George's County delegation. I, I hope I don't pronounce uh, the names incorrectly, but bear with me. I wanted to give a special shout out to Senators Griffith, Patterson, and Rosa Pepe. I hope I did that correctly. Um, this bill will establish the Office of Digital Inclusion in the Department of Housing and Community Development to ensure that every resident of the state is supported by high quality broadband internet service. 
at an affordable price and has the tools necessary to use and take advantage of the internet. Um, it is a bill requiring the governor to appoint the director of the office and also requiring the office to develop by July 1st, 2022, a statewide plan to ensure all state residents have the ability to connect to reliable broadband internet by December 31st, 2029. We thank you all for supporting this bill. And we know that there was a briefing in the house on the 26th, uh, just a couple of days ago. And um, there will be a briefing in the Senate, in the Senate on uh, supposedly February 9th. So we look forward to hearing uh, the results of those hearings and uh, hopefully the support of the bill onto signing by the governor. Thank you. Thanks, Bellaney. And Shelly, would you please talk a little bit about digital equity and ebook access? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, I'm talking about House Bill 518 and Senate Bill 432 on ebook access. So, as uh, Roberta has mentioned already this morning, the importance of ebooks and uh, audiobooks is just is so important right now. We've learned that during COVID. Um, just our library system has circulated almost 400,000 ebooks in this past year, and it's only growing by exponential amounts. The situation, though, is that the publishers can charge libraries much higher rates, two and three times what you would pay on Amazon for an ebook. So the example that I posted on social media the other day was there's a book that came out a couple weeks ago by Avani Dashani called Burnt Sugar, and it's on the 2021 Booker Prize list. It sells on Amazon to you and me for $9.99 and you have that book forever, but the library is being charged $53.26 for a two year lease. So you can see that exponentially we're paying a lot higher prices. There are others that um, don't allow us to even purchase an ebook or we are delayed six to eight weeks to purchase an ebook. So what we're asking for in this bill is just to be reasonable and fair and allow libraries to participate and have access and access for all. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Megan, did you want to add anything to the Building Lifelong Learners Act? Um, I think we've covered a lot of that, but we would just um, thank you. Um, for supporting that again, all of your um, colleagues in the Senate for Prince George's County voted in favor of that override. And it really helps us. Um, we are so proud that we went fine free for all of our customers in July of 2020. But this ensures that our youth across the state can borrow library materials without the fear or burden of paying overdue fines. And that's a really big um, point of access for us, for our youth who come to the library for everything from board books to college and career preparation. So we thank you for your continued support and hope that you will again um, support that legislation on February 8th. Thank you, Megan. And Brett, would you like to say a, a few quick remarks from the Library Board of Trustees? Sure. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Library Trustees, uh, I would like to offer the same thanks and gratitude that others have expressed. Uh, you've probably heard this before, but the, you know, the library's role in the community is changing. Uh, it is not the same traditional library that I grew up with and you probably grew up with. Uh, it's much more than just reading and literacy, although those are still extremely important roles for the library. Um, Prince George's County Library System is deeply involved in public health initiatives and workforce development and economic development and many other aspects of community development. And it's part of a, a fundamental um, rethinking of how the library should operate. And, and that new way of thinking is a very collaborative way uh, where everything the library does is really aimed at not just helping the public succeed, but also helping many, many partner organizations uh, whether they're nonprofits or other public sector government agencies to help them be more successful, to help them be more effective in achieving their missions. And with the changing technologies uh, where we're essentially having to maintain 
two libraries in one. We have a digital library and a physical library uh, and services aimed at both sets of, of users. Uh, that has really created a lot of pressure on us to be able to deliver the high quality services that the community needs and deserves. Uh, so while we are very grateful for all of the support that the library has received, both from the state as well as from the, the local community, uh, quite frankly, the long-term trend really isn't sustainable. And I just wanna highlight that for you all that uh, looking ahead to future years, uh, support for libraries in general really will need to increase. And I, I'm speaking not just on behalf of Prince George's County, but I'd say statewide, all of the libraries are going to need uh, additional resources, additional support to reflect the uh, greatly expanded roles that they're playing and the demands being placed on them uh, to be able to meet those roles. Uh, so again, I thank you very, very much on behalf of the board uh, for the support that you have uh, offered us in the past and, and we look forward to that in the future. Thank you, I see we have some questions. Yes, uh, Delegate Lehman, then Fennell, and then Valentino Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to um, all of you for being here and, and telling us about the great work that uh, the library system is doing. It, it strikes me that you're, you've are you become something of a combination, social services, education, and, and healthcare agency, and more. And, and thank you so much for that. Um, two questions. One, um, have we uh, gone ahead and done away with um, uh, late fees? I, I know other counties have done that and there was a recommendation to do away with that statewide. I just don't remember if that has happened. And you know, do you have any observations about, um, about, about that, that system? Um, yes. Whether it has impacted revenue um, or whether overall it's been a good thing. Um, we did go fine free in July of 2020. Um, for all of our customers. And it was a small revenue source for Prince George's County. But what happened is we felt like we were eliminating barriers and creating equity. And so circulation has certainly risen and people who had not used the library have come back to the library because they know that there's no fines and there's no barriers for them. So for our customers, it has been a, a real blessing for them, and they have uh, used us even more in, as a result. If you could just explain really quickly then what is, because I have this question when I first heard about, um, you know, doing away with fines, what then is the incentive for folks to return their materials? Well, we still charge for people who have lost materials or damaged materials, but it's really interesting because we find that, you um, they just return them. There hasn't been any problem with getting materials back. I think knowing that there isn't the stigma of having a fine, um, they actually are more readily returning them because there is no, um, there's no shame, which there shouldn't be. It's a library book. So I think that's really resulted in, in books coming back just as frequently as they had before. Excellent. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. One last quick question. Um, I just had my, my aide ask me, is it too late to donate a coat, um, a winter coat? And where do folks take them? I, I, we probably all have a coat or two or a jacket in our closets that we, that we you know, in good shape that, that we're willing to donate. But is that still going on? Well, Operation Warm was uh, sponsored by Wawa and, and some of our other partners, and those were new coats that were distributed to ch children. Um, I'm sure there's somebody collecting coats. Let me find out for you, because I think that definitely would be something the library would be willing to help with. Okay, so that was strictly for children. Is that even still going on or no? No, it was it was a um, program that happened in uh, December, and we do it yearly. Um, so last year we only had one distribution site, and this year we were able to have five distribution sites, and went from a uh, hundred coats to almost seven hundred and fifty. So we want to keep increasing that capacity every year. Great, that is really impressive. I'd love to talk to you offline about about um, expanding the program. Sure. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. 
That's all we get to know. Yes. Hi, Roberta. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you all for what you're doing. Um, I heard you mention that uh, you was doing, um, the library system was doing a food drive. And if so, how, you, how are you dispersing the food out to the community? Well, we've been involved... We've been involved in several food drives. Um, one was at our Spalding location where we just created a food pantry and it was uh, more or less a um, first come first serve. But we also provide, provided uh, books at Councilwoman Galeris's Riverdale Cares event. So we're working with community partners who are distributing food um, and what our role is, is to um, have the site in a, lot of, in a lot of times or go to their site. And what we want to do is promote literacy at those events. And for example, at Riverdale Cares, we distributed over 2,300 books in both English and Spanish. So customers were getting uh, a holiday meal and a book and also um, some exciting backpacks full of play from Parks and Rec. So it was kind of a united front. And we have been doing those kinds of events throughout the COVID. Good job. Let me know what I can do to help. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll give Valentino Smith. Thank you. Good morning, delegation. Um, two, maybe three questions. One is first, with respect to homelessness, if a family or students are homeless, which Unfortunately, even before the pandemic, we were having an increase in our school system. And now, even after, we anticipate more. Do they have the availability without an address to be able to get a library card? And do they have the availability to be able to access library services? Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, let my colleague Nick field this question, because I know we do have a virtual library card. Yes, um, so there's there's kind of two components to this. I'll, meant, I'll cover the first one, then I'm gonna invite my colleague Michelle to jump in on the second part. The first part is if that student is enrolled in the Prince George's County Public Schools, their school ID automatically gives them access to the library. So there isn't that additional step of having to verify uh, an address with the library system. They're automatically given the access just through their being enrolled in the, in the school district. Um, my colleague Michelle can speak more to the specifics on if they are outside of the school system and or if they're adults. Good morning. Currently, we have a uh, computer access card, so anyone can get an access card. They do not have to borrow. I mean, have, they do not have to have an address. We um, don't ask for ID, so they can come in. They can use uh, the computers and have access to all of our electronic resources, and that's whether they're an adult or a child. Um, and if they are enrolled in school, then they can get a, ch a child can get a student card if they're not in a um, Prince George's County public school. So, so right now, um, anybody has access to electronic resources and to our computer services. Thank you. Um, second question is, you're obviously expanded a lot of your services to the community and some very needy communities. And it would be helpful to the delegation if you could give us a picture of the county and the jurisdictions and the local communities that you think have had the most expanded need. In other words, where are we seeing more students than ever start to use the library and areas or pockets of concern that you have for underutilized access um, to the library? It will help us understand um, all more of the specifics for Prince George's County. And then third, wondering if you're gonna be in partnership with the county and the Maryland Department of Health to help be an access point for spreading communication about vaccine administration. And you've already been involved with that or asked to um, because of your ability to reach so many people. Yes, thank you. Um, we have been, um, very, very connected to the county and disseminating information through the uh, Joint Information Committee. In fact, we have also provided both research and graphic design for the county. 
in helping them to get the word out about um, vaccination and other healthcare um, priorities. So we do work in conduct conjunction with them. We are also posting uh, for the county on our social media accounts, which have really exponentially risen during this period. And so that is uh, something we're working on. I have been working with Dr. Goldson uh, with the school district. We're working on getting a heat map um, delivered that will show areas where connectivity in Prince George's County is in more need. Um, and so that will help us determine where we need to add resources as partners with the school. Um, and what we're noticing is that probably our central area usually has the most computer need. We are working on a reopening plan um, to open some of our locations, all of the ones in central and some of our other bigger branches. Um, we hope soon for uh, computer appointments so that we can get more folks in uh, applying for jobs and handling resumes and, and that sort of thing. So that's all in the planning stages. Um, I would like um, Mulaney or Michelle to talk about maybe what areas they see have the greatest needs. Okay. No, you can go, Michelle. Okay. <laughs> the greatest needs right now, I think, are in uh, Central. So the Spaldings area, Fairmont Heights and Hillcrest Heights. And then the South. Uh, we're having needs and, and the South also has connectivity issues. Um, and also in our West area, we're seeing in that Riverdale community, we have a large immigrant population and um, who have who are fearful still see the library as a government agency. So we have to reach out to them more. We are looking for ways to perhaps get um, computers. We do offer uh, Wi-Fi access. We have Khajiits that uh, customers can borrow. So if they have a device that can connect to the internet, then they can borrow the Khajiits. But the greatest need are in those communities. But I want to also mention that there's need all over our county. So even in the wealthiest areas of our county, there are still pockets in communities where children and adults need assistance, um, need access to computers. We understand that even if uh, Comcast or Verizon provided connectivity, there's still some re reasons why they don't, the um, homes do not have connectivity. So um, there's need all over the community, all over our um, county. Thank you. I just wanted to plug in what you just said, Michelle, about affluent areas. I mean, Baden is my area, I would say remoteness um, disables uh, people from being as connected as they could be. So um, that's when we think about it broadly, um, no pun intended, um, remote areas have a hard time of being connected as well. Although um, not because they can't afford it, but just because of where they are. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Holmes. Then, uh, thank you, Mr. Ch then William. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my, my question is on a much lighter note. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, not too many people were aware of my love for reading, uh, nor were they aware of my home library, because now that we have Zoom, uh, you know, my, my Zoom meetings are held in my home library because it's more comfortable, et cetera. Uh, and my mother was a librarian. Uh, so from a very, very young age, uh, I learned uh, very specifically and succinctly the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, and in my library at home, the books are primarily grouped by the Dewey Decimal System. And I was just wondering, is that system still being used? Is that Dewey Decimal System still being taught? Just curious. Yes, we do still use the Dewey Decimal System and it is taught. Um, I think there are some libraries uh, across the country that are looking at more of a bookstore feel and using more general uh, word-based uh, categories such as travel um, or biographies. But in Prince George's County, we are still using the Dewey Decimal System. So your training will come in handy when you get back in your home library and get to browse the stacks. 
Um, we also are looking uh, at everything through an equity lens. So um, our cataloging is now looking, we're going through it and looking at how we can get customers they book the books they want. In addition to the Library of Congress tags, what are some additional tags that people are looking for to get the books they want? So we're really kind of doing a, a broad spread um, review of uh, how we catalog books so that customers can get what they need. Um, just wanted to also say that um, we, are, uh, we are looking at um, language access growth and opportunity. We have made our webpage available in Spanish and we, our call center is also available in Spanish. We want to also look at the other languages that are the most prevalent in Prince George's County and start addressing those needs as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you, Delegate Fisher. Delegate Fisher, we'll, we'll circle back. Uh, Delegate Williams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick question. One, I just wanted just to say thank you guys so much for everything that you all are doing. Um, I always hear kudos. People have really loved the, the, when you guys had it, the drive-by um, system, especially uh, at the Greenbelt Library is the one I hear the most about, um, and which leads me to my next question, the Hyattsville Library, which is also in my district. I know it's undergoing construction. I just wanted to you can provide an update about when um, the potential reopening of it. I know we have kind of the makeshift Hyattsville Library over near the wall right now while the construction is going on, but I was just wondering if you can give an update um, regarding the status on the new Hyattsville Library. Sure. So um, I'm going to kick that over to Michael Gannon. He produces um, hard hat librarian videos that show you the updates and you can go online and watch that. But Michael, if you will go ahead and, and speak to this, please. Sure. We had some delays in the construction of Hyattsville due to the pandemic and then also because of some unsuitable soils. But we are looking at late spring opening. Uh, so we are, um, we, we finally got the um, heat running. So that was a big thing. You, they couldn't put anything in there until the carpet and the uh, furniture, the millwork and all couldn't go in yet until we had heat. So they got the heat running this week, which was good. So we're looking at a late spring uh, opening for Hyatt. Oh, okay, great. I drive past her all the time. So I kind of- Well, and we're hoping that it'll, the conditions will warrant us having a big ribbon cutting because, you know, virtual ribbon cutting is not the same as going in the building. So fingers crossed. I agree. I agree. And then we can see the new saucer that's back and all that fun yeah, stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Look at Fisher's back on. Yeah. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. I wanted to um, commend um, Nick. I was able to, and some of my neighbors participated in um, the senior card um, program during the holiday season. And so uh, one, I wanted to know how did that program go and the success of it? And um, I was very encouraged by that. I think um, the mental health during this time has been tough on our, in our county. And if you all were looking to do that again um, this year for our seniors in, our, in Prince George's. Well, thank you so much, Delegate Fisher, for that. Um, we really appreciate the kind words about the project. So uh, the, the County Office of Emergency Management and also uh, Family Services came to us and said, we need to figure out something to keep the senior community engaged over the holidays while they're isolated. Uh, we uh, came up with a plan cr pretty quickly. Our designer came up with a, a custom card design that featured National Harbor, which is pretty cool. And then um, we put out the call. Uh, because of the various uh, COVID closures that we have had, and then also the challenges with U.S. Postal Service, it was incredibly difficult to make this happen within the two weeks that we basically had to execute it. Um, but we did get an overwhelming response. 400 households wrote in wanting to participate, families, intergenerational, teens doing service hours. So the expectations were totally blown out of the water in terms of the turnout. We are 100% committed to making this an annual program, doing it with much more advanced notice and getting many more people involved. And um, 
once we ran through our supply of cards, which happened very quickly, um, folks were more than happy to step up pro with pro providing their own cards or custom creating some cards. And the, the piece that was really special was the way that the school system as a whole mobilized around this project because the teens have been really um, having a challenge with getting enough projects for service hours. And this was a really perfect opportunity for them to kind of um, get creative. Um, and another thing that the teens did around this time that was really cool was they learned graphic design skills as part of our teen action group uh, to put together some holiday animations and graphics for our new teens Instagram. Um, so there's a lot of cool things going on that are fun and helping them with service hours, but then also getting them some new skills. Thank you so much. And if you could all um, send, I think the delegation would appreciate things for our, our younger students that you guys are doing. They're looking for service hours so we could send that out. That'd be great. Happily, thank you so much. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so I just wanna thank you, Ms. Phillips and your team uh, for being with us this morning. It really was very informative and a pleasure. Um, we will we will be looking out for uh, those those bills, including the uh, the uh, 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 bill from last year that was vetoed. Um, keep us informed. We'll do the same. And uh, uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair, for and all the delegates for your time and support. We know you're all champions for libraries and for the community in Prince George's, and we. We are Prince George's proud, so thank you so much. All right, amen. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the rest of our agenda. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order uh, because Chair Proctor has a um, an appropriations meeting to get to. Uh, so we can go to uh, education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a we have a program planned actually for our education committee next week. We're going to have Dr. Uh, Juanita Miller, who is the new chair of the Board of Education. Um, she is coming to meet with the subcommittee, but we are opening the any of our delegates and all of our delegates to come and meet her and hear her vision and have whatever concerns or questions you have addressed. And that's uh, this, this coming Wednesday. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, by County, uh, Chair Valderrama. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Delegate Valderrama. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. You sound really low, but we can hear you. Hold on, hold on. Let's see. It's hard to hear you, Chair Barron. Oh, it's Delegate Valderrama. Can you hear me now? Hello? Now, Chair, um, uh, really Chair Delegate Valderrama, we can hardly hear you. Um, if you can't. Um, uh, it, hold on. Hold okay. On. I don't know. Oh, dish. I don't know why this is. I can hear. It was working perfectly. Um, all right. Hold on. Let me turn this off. Is that better? Uh, it's a little bit, but. <laughs> If you could turn it up a little more. There you are. Okay. Is, is that better? A lot better. I don't know what's yes. happening. Okay. All right. We only had one bill on the docket, Mr. Chairman. That was MCPG 10121, which was park and planning um, mandatory referral review. It passed out of Montgomery County um, unanimously, as well as our subcommittee yesterday. Um, basically, it just defines a complete submission. Um, as an expl explanatory narrative accompanied by engineering. But the basic explanation uh, I wanna give um, was from, oh, and just to also mention, park and planning is in full support of this, of this bill. 
And also want to mention this bill came out of our subcommittee last year, unanimously moved out of delegation, unanimously went to ENT, and I'm not sure what happened with it over there. But I also want to add that uh, the reason they support the bill uh, is because the mandatory referral process is the only opportunity for public disclosure, analysis, and comment on development projects that are undertaken by state and local government agencies. So that's the background of the bill. Um, again, it moved out unanimously in our subcommittee last year, this year, and last year in delegation. All right, great. Do we have, do we have a motion? Wait a minute. I move. Wait a minute, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a discussion? Delegate Turner? Uh, uh, can uh, the delegate uh, tell me what was the number of that bill again? I, I missed it. I couldn't hear it. Uh, delegate Chris Valderrama, what was the number of the bill again? 10121. 10121. Okay. Okay. I'd also like to mention, Mr. Chairman, that it passed. Um, I, I did say it went to ENC, but it passed the House last year. Okay. Passed the House. All right. Any any um, further discussion or can, questions, Delegate Lehman? I'm sorry. Can can she give the title as well one more time? I apologize. I'm. It's okay. It's the MCPG 10121 Park and Planning Commission Mandatory okay. Referral Review. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I move. Uh, I motion that we second. agree on 101-21. All right, there's been a motion and a second roll call. Delegate Ben Barnes? Yes. Delegate Daryl Barnes? Yes. Delegate Charles? Yes. Delegate Davis? Delegate Fresnel? Yes. Delegate Fisher? Yes. Delegate Harrison? Yes. Delegate Healy? Delegate Holmes? Aye. Delegate Ivy? Aye. Delegate Lehman? Aye. Delegate Lewis? Delegate Penny Melnick? Delegate Proctor? Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Valderrama? Aye. Delegate Valentina Smith. Delegate yeah. Walker. Oh, thank you. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Washington. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Williams. Yes. Chair Barron. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was the only bill on the docket. Uh, I will look at the rest of the agenda. Uh, we plan to meet next week again, 9 a.m. Uh, virtual. That's the end of the by county report. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, county Affairs, Chair Fennell. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. We had two um, bills that moved out of the um, subcommittee. Uh, one of the bills was um, Prince George's 402. Dash 21, Natural Resources, Sunday Deer Hunting, Prince George's County. That was Senator Michael Jackson at that time, Delegate Michael Jackson. Uh, the summary of this bill was the bill authorized the Department of Natural Resources to allow a person in the county to hunt deer on each Sunday during the deer hunting season from the first Sunday in October through the second Sunday in January, inclusive. The department may also authorize a person in the county to hunt on public land designated for hunting on this Sunday. Uh, this bill was passed four to zero. Is, is there a motion? Move favorable. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Delegate Williams. Delegate. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Washington. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Valentino Smith. No, and explaining my vote, I always traditionally.
voted no on Sunday hunting in any direction. Delegate Valderrama. Aye. Delegate Turner. Aye. Delegate Proctor. Delegate Pena Melnick. Delegate Lewis. Delegate Lehman. Uh, no, in explaining my vote, um, I do not want to see Prince George's County join the rest of the counties in the state to have hunting seven days a week. It's not necessary. Um, I feel very strongly about this. Thank you. Delegate Ivy. Yes. Delegate Holmes. Aye. Delegate Healy. Aye. Delegate Harrison. Yes. Delegate Fisher. Yes. Delegate Fresnel. Yes. Delegate Davis. Delegate Charles. Yes. Delegate Daryl Barnes. Yes. Delegate Ben Barnes. Yeah. Is that a yes or a no? Sorry, no. Thank you. Okay. Del Chair Barron. Yes, bill passes. Thank you. Um, the next, Mr. Chair, is Prince George's 4, 721. Um, we had two amendments on it. This is Maryland Emergency Management Agency, Department of Transportation, and Department of Environment, Environment study on historic and recent flooding in Prince George's County. Uh, this was Delegate Ivy's bill. Um, uh, it passed out four to zero uh, with, um, with um, we have an amendment, two amendments. Is Shane, are you on Shane? He he is. Yes. I, I'd also be happy to uh, read the amendment yes. um, Can you as well. Can you the one, which, amendment one, which is a technical amendment, and then the second one, please? Sure, yep. Yeah. Um, so amendment one is technical. It just makes changes to the uh, short title and the purpose paragraph. Amendment two makes the bill an emergency measure and requires the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and each municipality in the county or the municipalities designee to be invited to participate in the study. The Corps of Engineers and the municipalities are also encouraged to participate. Thank you. Is there a motion on the amendment as stated? Amendment one and amendment two? Or do we have to do it separate? Sorry, so the, the vote will be on the bill as amended. Okay. Um, so you don't have to vote on the amendment itself. Thank you. Is there a motion on the bill as amended? favorable. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, roll call. Delegate Ben Barnes? Yes. Delegate Daryl Barnes? Yes. Delegate Charles? Yes. Delegate Davis? Delegate Fresnel? Yes. Delegate Fisher? Yes. Delegate Harrison? Yes. Delegate Healy? Delegate Holmes? Aye. Delegate Ivy? Aye. Delegate Lehman? Aye. Delegate Lewis? Delegate Pena Melnick? Delegate Proctor? Delegate Turner? Yes. Delegate Valderrama? I can't hear her. Um, she's unmuting herself. Delegate Valentino yes. Smith. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Delegate Valentino Smith. Delegate Walker. Yes. Delegate Washington. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Williams. Yes. Chair Barron. Oh, we lost the chair. Oh, there he is. Chair Barron. Yes. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. The next meeting will be February the 3rd from 8.45 to 9.45 a.m. Please watch out for the, um, the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Fennell. Um, uh, law enforcement, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the uh, law enforcement committee had a um, 
had a briefing, um, which I think was pretty useful from uh, on speed camera, um, the current law and, and how, um, and that briefing, I'm sorry, a little distracted, was by um, Prince George's County um, Police Department Captain Tom Hendershot. Captain Hendershot is the head of the uh, speed control unit. He just took over the program a couple of years ago, but it was very informative. He talked about the considerations that the department um, currently looks at when it gets requests from either citizens uh, or civic leaders or elected officials for uh, speed cameras. And of course the current law limits that to um, a location within a half mile of a school or construction zones. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, Delegate uh, Harrison's bill that would e expand that uh, to include areas outside of school and construction zones based on uh, a law that Montgomery has had for a number of, a number of years. Um, but it was an interesting discussion. He talked a little bit about how the process is slightly different for state roads uh, that are near schools, and there are a uh, half dozen or more of those in the county. He also talked about where municipalities fit in with their own speed camera systems. Um, and there was, you know, so there were some good questions and good discussion. So that was um, uh, enlightening. And then we had just one bill on the agenda, PG 30321. That is my Briggs Cheney Road speed camera bill. We talked about whether um, those individual speed camera bills are still, in fact, necessary if uh, Delegate uh, Harrison's bill passed. So for now, I did agree to um, table or hold my um, speed camera bill. I was just a reminder to everyone, I was requested to put that in by my council member as well as um, residents of District 21. So um, that was it in terms of our agenda. I did not schedule a meeting for this coming Thursday because as of right now, we have um, no other pending bills. And so when we adjourned, as of the time of the adjournment of the meeting, I said we are not planning on a meeting for next Thursday. That, that could change um, if, if I am made aware of a bill that's ready. Uh, the only one that comes to mind at this point is possibly Delegate Valderrama's speed bill for 210. Um, I will talk to her offline about that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I do need to know um, from you uh, as well as uh, Ms. Hippolyte, what is the um, deadline for me deciding for transparency purposes and for the public's uh, information whether we will have uh, business to do next Thursday? All right, thank you. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that uh, at our next leadership meeting. Thank you. Thank you, that's all, thank you. Okay. Um, Moving along, is there any delegation business, any general business for the good of the order? All right, hearing none, um, we can adjourn. <laughs>